we looked at the theme that the president created for his inauguration, uh, creating the future, the role of the university in transforming the world. And we created three academic symposia that featured a selection of our faculty. We obviously have over 600 brilliant scholars, scientists, artists to choose from. We have chose just a small sample of that rich community of thinkers. And we are just very fortunate today at this particular session to look at the, the globe. We're looking at the role of the university in transforming the globe in the work that faculty do as teachers, as scholars, scientists, and as people who translate the good work of their research into good practices, best practices around the world. Since we've already seen many cases where the work being done here is applicable to the challenges that face us around our planet. So this is our most global of the three symposia. We have chosen faculty. They've all been nominated by their colleagues and deans uh, to represent all of us. And I would like to begin by welcoming one of our colleagues, Dr. Navinder Seeram. You can look at his distinguished record. You've certainly uh, read some of the things about his work with uh, pomegranate juice and, and so forth, and most recently, right on the homepage, maple syrup. He is in the College of Pharmacy, and one thing you will see if you looked at all the symposia, we have at least one scholar from every degree-granting college in the university representing the diversity of thinking and research and teaching in our university. So please help me welcome Dr. Navinda Seeram, who will begin the program. Thanks, uh, Winnie, for the very great introduction. Um, it's, it is my pleasure and honor. I'm sorry that the president is missing my, my talk, but at any rate, I'm sure <laughs> you, for those of you who are watching this, it's being streamed online, URI Live. Um, you, you probably would not be able to see my slides. You're, going to miss a lot of great pictures, but I'll try to make this friendly enough so that you can follow along. So it's my pleasure to represent my college. Um, we have great colleagues in pharmacy. They're doing wonderful things here um, at URI. And my big idea, I'm a big thinker. That's why I'm here, right? That's what it's all about, um, is to take my view. Uh, it's a personal view, and, and I've thought about this. I've actually given this a lot of thought, big thoughts, big thinking. and and. And in 10 minutes, that's what we have, that's what I have, in 10 minutes with 10 slides, try to tell you using my research and teaching, and I want to do two things simultaneously. I want to take a micro view, so I want you to come into my lab and into my classroom, and then I want to do another thing, take a macro view, bring you outside of that, and hopefully, if I can pull this off, at the end of this all, I'll be able to use my research and teaching as a platform to illustrate to you how URI can transform the globe. I'll summarize and conclude at the end of my 10 minutes. It should be of no surprise to you that we are faced with health challenges. And not only in the USA, as you can see in these slides, but throughout the world. And I've chosen two, apart from infectious diseases and so on. I've chosen two. The first one here is obesity. And you can see here, it's now estimated that more than 300 million people worldwide are exposed to this uh, epidemic of obesity. Here you can see in the USA in 10 years periods, 1990, 1999, and 2008. And for those of you who can't see the slides, you can actually go on the CDC website and you can get these. But you will see here in 1990 where there was a lot of blue color, and that category there was about 10 to 14% of the population who were categorized as obese. Look what happened in 10 years' time, where they added in 20 to 24 percent of the population. And then just within the last 10 years, from 1999 to 2008, we jumped two different colors, two different categories, 25 to 29 percent, and now it's even greater than 30 percent. The other health challenge that we have, among many, is cancer. Cancer is threatening heart disease. It's actually going to overtake heart disease as a number one killer disease in developed countries. And if you look at this global incidence of, of cancer worldwide, 
you will see that predominantly here in North America, with the, with the red, red show in here, but certainly in other parts of the world, we're struggling with this disease. So what can you do about it? I tell my students, the things which are within your control, you control. The things which are without your control, you cannot control. Now, according to my reading, if it's in your genetic predisposition to get certain types of diseases, like certain types of cancer, you can't do anything about it. You probably cannot do anything about environmental pollutions and contaminants, but one of the things that you can do that's within your control is your diet and your lifestyle. And hopefully this diet, and I'll take this because I'm talking about medicinal foods today, talk about the role of diet and lifestyle, but certainly medicinal foods and how you can prevent and probably delay the onset of certain types of diseases. Now, I'm a plant natural product chemist. It means that I look within plants to find out what are the compounds within plants that can give us health benefits. Now, I say this to my students, and I have to say this again. Plants, by definition, are planted. They're rooted. They cannot get up like us and run away from sunshine, or they cannot put on sunblock, right? So they're exposed. They're living for three to 400 years. Now, if you really think about it, what, what, what are the plants doing? How can they survive for all this time? <laughs> Harmful UV radiation, just like us. Well, it turns out that plants have actually evolved mechanisms and compounds to protect themselves against different insults. For example, the pigments that you would find in berries are thought to be there by the plants to protect them from, from oxidation. Therefore, these pigments are antioxidants. There are, of course, different reasons. Maybe the pigments are there to attract potential pollinators or, 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 or birds to eat those fruits to disperse their seeds. For whatever reason it is, though, take a look at this slide. Now, I'm not talking nutrition here. I'm talking beyond nutrition. Because in nutrition, what you will learn is that we need macronutrients, which are carbs and fats, good fats and lipids, micronutrients, which are vitamins and minerals. I'm talking about something called phytochemicals or phytonutrients. Now, these are produced by plants. And these are serious chemical compounds. Look at it. Now, as I said, these things here, these molecules are there, produced by plants to protect the plants, but certainly if you think about eating a plant-based diet, you can actually intake more than a gram of these compounds per day. If you are eating five to seven servings of fruits and vegetables per day, or you're getting plant-based derived foods, for example, green tea or black tea, for example, coffee, for example, red wine, for example, orange juice, for example, broccoli, for example, whole wheat, for example, flax, and the list goes on. So among the many research projects that I'm doing in my lab, you know, I chose one which is very recent, very topical, and in my opinion, very exciting and intriguing. And the reason I'll tell you about this specific <laughs> project is for many. And, and, and before I get there, go to the next slide. Let me, let me tell you uh, that the funding and all the pictures that are shown here were, pro were provided by the funding agency, and in this case, it's CDAC, the Federation of uh, uh, Maple Syrup Producers in Quebec, and also Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. Most of the research done here was by my postdoc, along with graduate students and undergrads, but Lee Lee did most of the work. Now, this is important because this shows here the role that URI has taken up in partnering with Canada, our northern neighbors, in looking at a project, in looking at a product, which is so important to our region. <laughs> Now, you know very well, because many of you are from New England, that the sugar maple tree, among many maple trees, but the sugar maple tree is only found in North America, among the hundred of maple species. Now, the sugar maple tree produces a sap, which is tapped from the plant during the spring months, which is then boiled down 40 liters of sap to give you one liter of syrup. Why did I choose this project? So, in my big thinking that I was doing, I thought, one, for the thrill of discovery, research. Because it turns out that although maple syrup has been here for a long time, and it's a very unique product, you can get different fruits, you can get different vegetables in your diet, but it's predominantly the only tree sap that gets into our food chain. Now you think about it, you're eating a lot of different things, but this I think is very unique. It's, it's interesting that 
although some work has been done in identifying phytochemicals from maple syrup, there's still much to be done. So you think of the 300-year-old maple tree sitting there producing compounds, getting it into its sap, then we're taking the sap, we're boiling it down and concentrating those phytochemicals. It's interesting to know that the chemistry of these native compounds from the tree have not been established, which are in the <laughs> To use maple syrup to look at its impact on the region, locally and, and beyond locally. Because when you think about it, as I said, northeastern North America, Canada produces about 80 to 85 percent of maple, and then the rest of the maple syrup comes from the New England areas and parts of New York. But certainly, this word here, sustainable, needs to be underlined because maple syrup is sustainable. It's a niche resource for this part of the world. And the third reason is that I think that this project here uh, gives a unique opportunity for us to talk about consumer awareness. How can we use medicinal foods to educate the consumer? Because it turns out that five of you in this room, out of every 10 of you, do not know that maple syrup is different from pancake syrup. Now, I'm from the Caribbean, I'm from South America, and I spent a lot of time in the West Coast. I never had a clue. I gotta tell you guys this. I never knew because I never came to New England until two years ago when I, it was in my face. And then I saw people taking maple sap and then boiling it down. People assume, a lot of people, 50% of consumers assume that the sweetener that they use is a natural sweetener, which it's not, if it's not true maple syrup or honey for, the, for, for, for that case. But certainly, we'll restart this later. It gives a very unique opportunity for us to educate consumers that if you're choosing to eat a sweetener, if you're choosing, and consumers will use sweeteners, you can't stop that, that they should know that work first, maple syrup is a natural product. It may have some phytochemicals in it. There is a difference between real and fake stuff. But then it gives us a very unique opportunity. And I think as scientists, as scholars, as professors, it is our responsibility to scientifically, responsibly, responsibly communicate our scientific findings to the public. And I take my time, and I spend a lot of time doing this, telling them carefully the message, trying to move research that we have done in our lab to the consumer in a very responsible manner. A few more slides to get through. I didn't want to take away the punchline from you, but you know, this is not a research talk, certainly. But certainly, what we, what we did find is that there were more than 20 phenolic compounds, similar to what we found, uh, you know, what's been reported from berries and from red wine and from flax. It turns out that maple syrup has a cocktail of all of these different types of chemicals found in different healthy foods. And we're still in the process of identifying these molecules, more molecules, I think. It's exciting that we found 20. It was it's like brand news. It was great. It's exciting. Um, 13 of them have never been reported from maple syrup before. And of these, eight of them are reported from the maple family for the first time. And as I said, you know, this is just the tip of the iceberg, six months of research with many more years to go. And therefore, as I wind this down, how can we use teaching and research? Well, my take on it, as I said, my big idea is that from the lab to the classroom and vice versa, because it's not always, it's not always easy to have all of the undergrads in your lab, although I do that to a great degree, four or five undergrads at every one time, apart from my grad students, of course. But what I try to do, and within our pharmacy professional curriculum, there is uh, medicinal plants that I'm involved with, and also self-care one, which I co-teach with other colleagues in pharmacy, um, uh, where the pharmacy student is exposed to herbal medicines and potential interaction between natural products and, er and, and drugs, herb-drug interactions, herb-herb interactions, certainly the pros and cons of using uh, herbal medicines, and, but certainly with functional foods. Uh, this year, we rose to the challenge. Our pharmacy college um, started uh, a brand new gen ed class called BPS 203, Herbal Medicines and Functional Foods. We meet with 50 undergrads every uh, week, twice a week, and they're having a great time. And I must say, it's one of the most rewarding teaching experiences I've had in a long time. But then, bringing the research, so brand new research, 
breaking news from my lab into the, into the classroom. And I think what I try to do is challenge my students, graduate students, undergrad students, but use research and teaching hand in hand because in my mind, they're like salt and pepper. They go together. Or like maple syrup and pancakes. Um, there's not much I can say to conclude, but, but certainly um, this is a historic event and it's, we're here to celebrate uh, what President Dooley and his inauguration. But I was very intrigued by reading this quote from him and therefore I'll end my 10 minutes. I hope I'm on time. Yes? Great. Um, I want to end my, my, my talk, my part here, by, by just reading this quote from President Dooley um, to you. We want to infuse in the entire enterprise of the University of Rhode Island the thrill of discovery of having the students feel that they are part of an institution where they don't know what's coming next because it hasn't been discovered yet and that they are going to be participating in that thrill of discovery. Thank you for your time. Part of our efforts in looking at the globe involves our partnerships in international education. And clearly, a key player in the discovery of knowledge about language and culture and literatures is our Department of Modern Languages and Literatures. Uh, our next speaker is sort of a triple threat fellow and one man interdisciplinary team, Dr. Alain Philippe Durand, who is a professor of French, a professor of English, and a professor of film media. You may know that he took a very well run, but a tiny French program and turned it into one of the largest in the United States with partnerships all over the world. It's my great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Dr. Alain Philippe Duran. Thank you very much, uh, Winnie. Thank you for having me. Between 1999 and 2010, the University of Rhode Island saw a constant growth in its number of French majors. We went from approximately 30 to 160, excuse me, 161 as of today, French majors. In 2006, I contacted several of the largest public universities in the country. This is what I found. All schools surveyed had a total enrollment almost three times higher than URI. Except for Michigan State and the University of Minnesota, no other school had more majors in French than URI. URI had by, had by far the highest ratio in terms of total enrollment in French classes, about 450 students per semester and number of majors, 161 out of 450. URI is the only institution in the country to have French majors pursuing double majors and dual degrees in 46 different majors across seven colleges. There are students at URI who double major in French and in disciplines as varied as English, Italian, marine biology, film media, uh, secondary education, engineering, communication, business, nutrition and dietetics, psychology, pharmacy, or textiles, fashion, merchandising, and design, to only name a few. In fact, URI colleges are so committed to French and other languages that the deans of the College of Arts and Sciences, Business, Engineering, Environment and Life Sciences, human science and services, pharmacy, and the director of the honors program all accepted our invitation to meet with French government officials when they visited our campus back in February. While the love of Americans for the French language, literature, and culture, and the URI French faculty hard work uh, certainly play a big role in these results, they are not the unique reason for these impressive accomplishments. When you think of it, URI is not the only American university to employ outstanding, dedicated, and hardworking faculty members, and it is not the only university to claim its interest in internationalizing its programs. However, URI is certainly one of the very few institutions in the nation that is internationalizing across its academic structure and that is committed in removing any administrative barrier that will stand in the way of interdisciplinary partnerships including between disciplines from different colleges. Unlike what happens at most universities, URI removed several curricular requirements that used to make it very difficult, much more expensive, and longer for a student to graduate with a BA in a language and a BS in another college. 
Today, with a few exceptions at URI, it is possible to double major or pursue a dual degree in English or in a modern or classical language and still graduate in four years. And the dual degrees that do take longer, such as engineering or pharmacy, do offer a big plus, that is, a professional internship abroad. URI also continues to maintain an atmosphere that encourages interdisciplinary partnerships campus-wide. Most recently, the university began sponsoring an international distinguished lecturer series. It also devoted an entire chapter to global citizenry in its 2010-2015 academic plan. URI is taking a much more aggressive approach toward global education than most other universities I am familiar with. It does not just suggest or encourage global education. It makes it a requirement, as proven by the fact that it lists, quote, develop foreign language competencies among greater number of students as one of its objectives in the next five years, and the provost also formed a global education task force. In the near and longer future, I would like the University of Rhode Island to pursue its ambitious internationalization plan by including and investing resources in the required studying of the humanities disciplines such as English and modern and classical languages, literatures, and cultures. And here is why. A modest suggestion of an approach I success successfully use for the studying of French that I would like to propose when thinking in terms of global education. It could seem paradoxical, but most of the arguments I use when promoting the studying of French actually come from my observing of the studying of literature in France and in the United States. Why do so many native speakers of French major in French in France or in the US? Why do so many native speakers of English major in English in England or in the US? Aren't they wasting their time and their money? Why should we teach modern or classical languages when everybody around the world involved in international activity speaks English and when classical languages are dead anyway? My experience convinces me that trying to promote to students and parents the so-called practicality of studying classical or modern foreign languages through the linguistic ability only is unsuccessful. If we could have the, the website uh, on, please, uh, from the French program. Thank you. As you can see on the screen and as of today, we have more than 90 profiles posted on the alumni section of our website. If you take the time to read them, you will notice that while many of our alumni use French regularly or occasionally as part of their jobs, the majority does not. You will also notice that a wide variety of professions and position levels are represented. Finally, you will notice three things that all these URI French alumni have in common. They all have a job. They all took the time to send me an update on their whereabouts and none of them work as a cashier at a fast food restaurant or at a video store. <laughs> All these French graduates who never use French in their work, including those who graduated in French only at URI, they still take <laughs> As I always tell parents and <laughs> You can come with me tonight when I go get my car on the parking lot. There will not be some angry URI French alum waiting for me with the iron bar yelling, what did you do to me? Look at me now. I live in the streets because of your stupid useless degree. <laughs> Why is that? Part of it is because URI offers an outstanding value and education and a first class French faculty. If you have seen the TV commercials, you will have noticed that our university decided to, to promote itself with a French accent. A very beautiful place. <laughs> but I believe that the main reason for these very smart students to go on with French, regardless of what their other interests were, the reason why they keep in touch and take the time to send us their updates and gratitude is the personal attention they received at URI the time their advisor took to explain to them, and sometimes to their parents, why studying French or another foreign language was a very good idea, what it would bring to their life and to their career, whatever it would be. 
What I am proposing is that we do not focus on the language only when promoting the studying of classical and modern languages. We should also repeatedly include and emphasize in priority those other practical and immensely marketable skills that the studying of a classical or modern language, of, or modern language literature, culture, and the studying of any other discipline in the humanities will give students. We need to show that a degree in any language is a great investment that often results in job offers, including for average students, those with average GPAs, the non-honors students, including students who will have a job in which they will never have to use the foreign language they major in ever again, including students who are not interested in international business, international relations, or teaching, including students who did not double major with a professional degree in college. Among other things, we need to emphasize that regardless what your interest, background, or origins are, at the University of Rhode Island, we have something for you. Majoring in a classical or modern language is not only useful if combined with certain degrees or for certain careers. Majoring in a classical or modern language is useful and marketable in the new global society. I believe that teaching a language is also teaching how to think. I tell myself, if everything I teach in a French class was taught entirely in English, would my students still learn a huge amount of crucial skills that they could use for whatever they will end up doing in life, including in a job where they will never have to speak a foreign language? The answer must be yes. What I tell students, parents, and administrators is that the specific skills you will learn in our language courses at the University of Rhode Island are skills that will be tremendously helpful and marketable regardless of the job or career you choose. Just like studying religions is important and useful to someone who is not religious, the studying of a foreign language is not just about teaching how to order from a menu in a restaurant abroad. The studying of a language also teaches the following skill. The capability to adapt and to endure foreign, unfamiliar, and stressful environment and situations. The aptitude to speak in public anywhere above than average memorization, writing, and analytical skills. The ability to endure heavy loads and still make tight deadlines. Highly trained in manipulating and interpreting fiction and reality. And the capability to analyze, evaluate, understand, situate people of any background. I thank you for your attention. I'm wondering if there's been any attempt to study the possible health benefits of the phytochemicals in maple syrup. The question is uh, if there are any possible plans to study the health benefits of the phytochemicals in maple syrup. And absolutely yes, I think um, the past six months that we've been involved in the research has been doing chemistry in terms of finding out what the compounds are, evaluating their levels and not only their levels, but, but trying to understand geographical changes, production, different grades of maple syrup. But then certainly, once we've done that, it's fascinating, I think, to think about a complex food matrix with natural sugars, in this case, sucrose, but certainly the phytochemicals embedded within that matrix, what would they do ultimately when it gets into your body? Or are we combining berries and maple syrup together what happens. And I think in the future plans that we have, at least with our current collaboration with our partners over in Canada, is to investigate some of these questions. Thank you. Is it just a happy accident and luck that we, we drink, you know, we eat maple syrup? But what about other tree saps? Is there any thought to look into other trees? And the question is, um, is it only maple uh, tree sap or, or other tree sap? There, there are actually, and I just learned this recently, there is uh, some other minor comp sap that, that, that are, that are in, in, in our diet, including birch sap. I've saw, seen one paper on walnut tree sap. But certainly, by and large, the vast majority of the sap that we have in our diet is, is maple. Now, why that happened, I don't know. But from my understanding is that for hundreds of years, the Native Americans, the Native Indians, had figured out a way to use the sap for energy, and they actually drink the sap called the, the lifeblood of the tree, um, apart from using other parts of the plant for, for, for various other health benefits. But, um, you know, it's, I don't know, the, the, the thing is, it is here. It's been brought in to us, as my daughter would say, 
Um, and I think it's our responsibility to, to, to investigate it. And I want to do this really well and the right way. And just to put things in perspective, we actually extracted 40 liters of maple syrup to get these compounds. So we're really doing this definitively one time and, and, and properly. I remember the first time I met Dr. Oxley, I saw this charming, brilliant young woman who was working in energetic materials. And as a humanist, that sounded really very positive and exciting to me. And later I discovered she did research on explosives and pipe bombs. <laughs> Wasn't the image I had at all. But absolutely fascinating research uh, in the field of chemistry that really helps protect us and understand some of the threats to our existence and creates opportunities. Please help me welcome Dr. Jimmy Oxley. Thank you, Winnie. Um, you, I want you to know that you've just given me a research idea. We're going to try to blow up maple syrup. <laughs> you think I'm kidding. OK. Um, I want to tell you about research in the chemistry department, because I'm a chemist, because I think that's where it's at. And chemist does a lot of things for us. Now, probably the thing you think of first is we make new compounds. So here, indeed, is an attempt to make new compounds. And yes, students get involved. This is Jesse Moran. He graduated two years ago. And he's successfully employed, not speaking French, in at the uh, Naval Warfare Center. Uh, this is one of the compounds he was trying to make. And uh, another graduate student of mine scooped him on it. But that's one thing we do. And that's just one of many things uh, chemists do. We work in all areas, including food science. Now, this is an example of work being done by Dr. Euler and Dr. Luck of the chemistry department. Dr. Euler is our chairman. This is worried about food safety. And they have worked with uh, thermoactive pigments that change with temperature. And of course, when you get something like that, you say, what is it good for? And you need another good idea to figure out what it's good for. And it's good for barcodes on your meat products or on your milk so that if they have been exposed to temperatures higher than appropriate, say 40 degrees F, then that barcode permanently becomes unreadable and the store can't sell it to you. Right now you don't know the history, the thermal history of your product. So this is a project aimed at food safety through chemistry. Another uh, thrust in chemistry is energy. And I have two slides coming up on energy. This one is on lithium batteries. And of course, we all need better batteries. I think you can think of many applications. The one being targeted here is the electric car. And this is something Dr. Luck is working on with his research group, looking at uh, various new electrolytes that will have longer shelf life and, and longer operating time. And uh, he has put down his funders because, of course, Doing this kind of research in chemistry always costs money, so we have to look for funders. And he wanted me to particularly note that we have Rice Stack uh, supporting this work, as well as the various federal agencies in terms of the battery work. And then here's one that's caught the media's eye, biofuels. We have only a limited number of fossil fuels. But what about all these maple trees we're going to chop down? No, I'm teasing you. Uh, what about all these uh, re e sources that are easily uh, regenerated? Uh, biofuel is something they're researching in. And they're standing in front of a student-built bioreactor for waste cooking oil that indeed is a problem to get rid of for all of us. So it's a, a neat project, and it's undergraduate driven in this case. And then I'm going to switch to my research group, uh, mine and Dr. Smith, who I refuse to have his picture here, but he's sitting back there in a red shirt, and he's the only red shirt in the audience. Um, we do a number of things. One way we, we attract students into chemistry is we use the word forensics. And we do real forensic projects. This one is for the military, uh, a black compound that looked very much and felt very much like burnt toast came into us. And the question is, what is it? And of course, we had a big hint that it was sent to us, that it might not be burnt toast, that it might be an energetic material. And indeed, it was. And we identified what it was through chemical analysis. So chemical analysis is a big deal. Also in forensics, we did the first forensic study of pipe bombs, which Winnie was alluding to. We have shot 130 pipe bombs. 
Now you may think that sounds a little silly. And uh, let me assure you, we've only shot one in the state of Rhode Island, but we're hoping to change that. Uh, we're we're uh, looking at pipe bombs because nobody had put science into it. And when a, uh, a officer stands up in court, the requirement is that he quotes scientific literature. This is thought to be a bullseye pipe bomb. Why? Well, because it's been shown that this type of stretching of the perlite and the ferrite uh, structure of the pipe is indicative of that type of powder. So there needed to be a study on pipe bombs. And this particular picture was done with a high-speed camera uh, in looking at how a pipe bomb full of black powder fragments. And it actually fragments differently than one full of smokeless powder, because they're performing differently. And one of the outcomes of this study, which we didn't expect, is actually tell uh, EOD, explosive uh, disposal personnel, if you have to approach a bomb, what is the angle that you're least likely to be hit by fragmentation? So we're able to advise on that. And then we do environmental work with explosives. Near to home is the Massachusetts Missile Range. Of course, that is in a different state, but it's relatively close to Rhode Island. And we look at cleanup of these ranges in cases, in some cases, just so we can use them again for the same purposes, in other cases, so we can release them to civilians. Uh, one of the range management techniques is to burn off vegetation. And we participated in a study to see if that also would destroy the unexploded ordnance and, and worked on that project. Uh, then with our DHS Center of Excellence, and we were awarded uh, the DHS Center of Excellence two years ago. Our Center of Excellence is an explosive detection, mitigation, and response. So we do all of those. And we have folks working in all of those areas. Uh, characterization, determining what is an explosive. Our research group primarily works on that. Detecting explosives, that work is done by Dr. Euler's group, uh, so, uh, partners at Caltech, partners at Hebrew University and Weissman Institution, and uh, soon to be Florida International, and uh, then partners at uh, working on blast mitigation that's heavily supported by the engineering departments at URI, Arun Shukula, uh, Otto Gregory, uh, Hamuda Gomad, and Carl Russo, as well as researchers at Caltech, Purdue, University of Illinois. So this is a large effort that has, is just starting its second year of work. Uh, things that we look at for the characterization and our work in the chemistry department is identifying the precursors. In this case, I've listed what is likely to be used in large bombs. Uh, you know, when we've gone through, and we work a lot with the detection uh, organizations and with Joe Salter, uh, who is the head of TSA in New England. Uh, when we had uh, folks looking through our wallets at the airport, you're going, what kind of bomb do they think they're going to find in our wallet? So we talk about where they should be looking and what they might expect to find. And that's what this slide is about and how we're going to do something about it. Because two of the major precursors are ammonium nitrate, which is made worldwide on the 39 million metric ton level, and urea, which is easily converted to urea nitrate and is made worldwide on the 62 million metric ton level. This is a storage house for ammonium nitrate. And I've marked where, where it's made in, in North America. We have some proposals out there how to get a handle on these precursors that are so widely available, and we need them for legitimate use. But how do we keep the bad guys from using them? Here's another how do we keep the bad guys from using it project. Uh, this last September, you had uh, an Afghani citizen picked up uh, doing transport between Colorado and New York City. He was stockpiling Clorox 40, which is a hydrogen peroxide bleach for your hair. You would like to have that, or at least some of us would like to have access to that without having the bad guy make it into a weapon. So we're working on materials that we can add at the one part per million level and keep him from using that legitimate product to make a bomb. We also work with canine uh, teams throughout the country. You see stars there. We pioneered uh, some uh, 
some canine training aids on specific explosives that were too sensitive for the teams to be willing to train on them directly, teams like uh, Secret Service in Beltsville, uh, Maryland. And that happens to be John Kerwick from uh, New York Metro. We work with these folks and we turn out 1,000 dog training aids a month to support this program right now. Uh, and then we look for explosive residue. Uh, we are now turning out 300 of these combs a month to look at explosive residue. The results here are the results of a study that's recently published that said we know that when people work with explosives, it's in their hair, even if they've gone home and slept over the weekend. So that red circle at the beginning is Monday morning. Those folks weren't working with explosives over the weekend, but they still have explosives there, and we can find that out by combing their hair. We don't have to cut their hair. So we're working on that project at the moment, and it's being widely vetted by law enforcement as a forensic tool and a way to identify the bad guys. So my final slide about our group is here. Uh, this is some of the researchers in our group, and we are at the Block Island Ferry in August. We will be going back soon. We were invited back in January, and we said, can we wait to April maybe to go to the Block Island Ferry? Uh, we went out with what's called Viper Teams. Uh, that's a TSA project to screen transportation throughout New England. Uh, we've been to Port of Davisville, and we'll be at another exercise in May. Here we were screening folks from the Block Island Ferry, and the students were dressed as I thought was appropriate in blue with the, uh, black, uh, with the hats that said URI, and nevertheless, uh, different uh, folks who were driving in on their cars would say, are you the FBI? And they'd say, no, we're the URI. <laughs> so that, that seemed to be an acceptable answer. We are a, a law enforcement agency, uh, according to all the folks that are riding the Block Island Ferry. So if you see us this summer, uh, we've had a sweet deal, no money, but the students can grow cross on the ferry, sit on the beach all day, and then screen the, the passengers coming back. So the end of my story is that chemists can do anything, even run a university or possibly a country. Thank you. Everywhere I travel in the world, I hear people refer to our world-class graduate school of oceanography. And I think that's something we should all be proud of. And now I turn to a colleague who is a member of the faculty in the Graduate School of Oceanography, Dr. John Merrill, who works in the area of atmospheric chemistry and connects to all sorts of disciplines. Thank you, Winnie. I'm going to, uh, in my talk, I'm going to present some work that I've been doing with uh, people here at the university and with colleagues at other institutions. I'll get you ready by apologizing, saying my talk is a little less broad, a little more focused on specific projects. And it's also uh, at a level of abstraction that may contrast it with the other talks. I hope that um, you can stay with me. Uh, there's, of course, a, an interest in wind energy these days. And we've done a little bit of work in, in wind energy. Uh, we used an instrument that measures the vertical profile of the wind, the variation of the wind with height. We installed this instrument on our dock here at a coastal site. This is a baby step towards eventual deployment of this kind of instrumentation offshore, which is a goal that uh, a number of people have, but it's something that hasn't been possible so far. Here's some data from this installation. The, the curves show the probability of the wind occurring at various, the wind speed going at, I'm not going to use it, Winnie. Um, I hate these pointers, I'm sorry. Um, so the different colors show different heights, ranging from 40 meters to 200 meters. And uh, the probability that the wind blows with a given speed indicated on the x-axis is indicated by the value of this distribution. So using the estimates from the instrument, we now know how often the wind speed falls in each speed range at each height. That kind of data leads immediately to an estimate of the power. You can, you can make an estimate of the available power the wind energy resource. That's an engineering problem. Uh, I'm not an engineer. We're interested in the underlying questions. Why do the distributions look this way? What is the impact on the environment when we extract energy from the wind? 
Uh, we're, we're now looking into questions like what are, what are going to be the impacts of extracting wind energy in the offshore environment on surface waterways, perhaps on the erosion of a beach nearby. Those are, those are uh, questions that relate to the, the environment in which uh, we're doing our work. Another area we work in is atmospheric chemistry. This shows an instrumented aircraft. You're going to see something about an experiment, a project we did using this instrumented aircraft studying the oxidation of sulfur in the atmosphere. Sulfur is an important natural and pollution component of the atmosphere, and its oxidation uh, is a process that still needs a lot of study. There's a lot that needs to be learned about the oxidation of sulfur in the atmosphere. To study that kind of problem, we need big tools like the instrumented aircraft. We were participating in a, in a, a group of uh, you know, international, multi-institutional uh, group studying this problem. You see picture of the participants in this team uh, sitting next to the aircraft. Five of the people in this project were uh, people here, students and, and faculty here at the university, or alumni of, of this institution. We did this experiment in a very remote place near Christmas Island uh, in the tropical Pacific. Near that place, there's a, a flux of dimethyl sulfide, a, a, a heavy sulfur compound. This gas uh, bubbles out of the sea surface and gets oxidized in the atmosphere. We chose the spot because of the DMS. It's also a spot that's very remote, distant from sources of pollution, which would interfere with our measurements or make the measurements more complex. Measuring sulfur fluxes in the atmosphere is not a simple thing. The instrumentation that we used to make those measurements is specially developed and, and installed in the aircraft. Uh, that instrumentation needs to make measurements at very high speed and at extremely high precision in order to estimate the quantities that we need. That's what this instrumentation does. The, in addition to measuring the gas phase compounds, we also needed to measure aerosols, the microscopic particulates that form when sulfur oxidizes. Eventually, one of the products is sulfate, which forms into uh, you know, water droplets, uh, tiny aerosols in the atmosphere. Those have an impact on cloud formation. And uh, there's a climate connection. This cloud formation process can, uh, it's hypothesized, can regulate climate. That's one of the reasons we were funded to do this project. I'm going to show you some data here. And here's where I apologize for the level of abstraction. Um, what I'm showing here are vertical profiles of the flux of sulfur dioxide gas caused by photooxidation of dimethyl sulfide. Whew, what a mouthful. Uh, what, what, I want, what I want you to see, what I want you to look at is the, oops the uh, swarm of points near the bottom of these curves. There are, there are five frames here which show data at different times of the day overlapping four-hour intervals. And so early in the day is at the upper left. Late in the day is at the upper right. We made 14 different flights where we did these observations, but we grouped them all together versus the time of day. You see the swarm of points near the bottom. Um, early in the day, towards the upper left, the swarm of points forms a line that's nearly vertical. As the day goes on, that line gradually eases over to the right and becomes less and less sloped. That way of analysis, that way of looking at this, was thought up by my colleague here at URI. We didn't, we didn't get these data ourselves. These are the data of our colleagues. But this way of looking at it allows us to capture, in a quantitative way, the relationship between the photooxidation process and the fluxes that we're observing here. In contrast with the change in slope, the place where these, the swarm of points crosses the vertical axis, crosses the vertical line, that intersection point remains nearly constant throughout the day. That intersection point is governed by the structure of the boundary layer, by the way the air moves near the surface of the ocean. We're, we're looking at a process that includes photochemical processes and dynamic processes involved with the circulation of the atmosphere. We need to combine, we need to use both of those kinds of information. OK, that's a whole lot of words about a pretty complicated project. I have a message. The message is this is, a, this is an example of study in marine biogeochemistry. That's a complex field. We need more expertise in marine chemistry at the University of Rhode Island. That's my pitch for that part of the talk. This is a little more user friendly. I'm going to show you. Uh, work we did, we are doing, on the profile, the, the, the distribution of ozone in the atmosphere. Ozone is a 
is an important gas both as a natural product and as a pollution, uh, a product of pollution. Uh, measurements of the distribution of ozone are a fundamental environmental requirement. Uh, NOAA sponsors uh, measurements of the distribution of ozone at uh, five sites across the country, and URI is one of those sites. The instrumentation is relatively straightforward and can be prepared in a relatively easy way. We fly these instruments using a helium-filled balloon. So you see a couple of our most handsome interns here uh, preparing to send the instrument away. It takes about two hours for the, the balloon to make its flight through the atmosphere. The data are sent back by radio. Uh, we, we hardly ever get the, the instruments back. Here's a, an example of the ozone profile uh, observed using this technique. The blue line shows the distribution of ozone. This shows the, the lowest 15 kilometers of the atmosphere. So you see the ozone concentration is nearly constant near the surface, increases a little bit through the troposphere. In the lower stratosphere near the top of this graph, there's layering in the ozone profile. The uh, magenta and green lines show the temperature and humidity distribution, and we relate the distribution of ozone to the thermodynamic features of the atmosphere. This kind of observation, as I say, is an essential uh, fundamental observation. We combine observations like this from many, many profiles to look at, at things that go beyond simply the distribution of ozone. So this is, a, again, a rather complicated graph. This shows the tropospheric burden, the amount of ozone in the lower part of the atmosphere, um, plotted on the y-axis for each month of the year. And we've got many, many profiles. There's 300 profiles in this graph. Uh, and so you see that the amount of ozone in the troposphere is relatively low during the cold, dark months of the year, during the winter months. As the sunlight increases in intensity and duration and the temperature goes up, the tropospheric ozone burden increases. You see that gradually increase towards the middle of the graph. The color coding indicates what type of air mass we were in. We, here at Narragansett, we can be in tropical air masses, we can be in mid-latitude air masses, or we can be in polar air masses. We, combining the information this way allows us to see the relationships between the natural uh, variation of the ozone distribution caused by the circulation of the atmosphere and, and pollution sources. And we can also assess climate change using this kind of data. This sort of work, even though the instrumentation is relatively straightforward, this kind of work requires uh, careful thought and uh, quantitative ability. The students who we have work on this kind of project, those were all undergraduate students, but they're students we selected to have quantitative skills. Students, such students are less common these days than they used to be. There are fewer and fewer students who have good quantitative skills. There are also fewer and fewer students who are willing to take on quantitative pro problems, who are uh, you know, bold and, and, and ready to, to work on quantitative problems. I'm, I'm going to skip over the details of this graph. This is a very pretty picture that shows the surface ozone distribution, time of day on the y-axis, day of the year on the x-axis. I, I promised to skip over it, but I'll tell you a little about it anyway. <laughs> the, color coding, <laughs> the color coding shows the amount of ozone, and you see uh, the, uh, the color scale is at the right. That's in parts per billion of ozone. The green to yellow transition shows you the change between uh, healthy air and unhealthy air by the EPA standards. So you see near the upper red line several times during this year, this was 2007, you see several times the air became unhealthy here. This, these data are monitored for air quality purposes. We combine these data with our ozone profile and other observations to, uh, again, to, to tackle the complex relationships between how the ozone is moving in the atmosphere as a whole and what we see here at the surface. So my message, my uh, pitch for this is that as, as a university, we need to work hard to advance the quantitative skills of our students. Uh, to prepare them to work on problems that are of this kind of complexity so that they can uh, help us move forward into the, uh, into the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to take a moment and welcome President David Dooley and Provost Don DeHayes, who have joined us. Thank you. <laughs> Our
Our final speaker works in another very important area that the university is very proud of, and that's environmental related research. Please help me welcome Dr. Martin Bide, Professor of Textiles, Fashion, Merchandising, and Design, who does intriguing work with environmental aspects of the textile industry. Thank you, Dean Brownell, and uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, it's nice to see everybody wearing clothes. <laughs> Although the temptation today must be to leave a few off. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to concentrate less on my own work and, and, and celebrate more the work of my colleagues and how that relates globally. And it also uh, gives me the chance to point out some of URI's history and where, where we've been and where we're going. Um, our little textiles department started out as one of the essential pieces of the land grant mission, um, doing uh, educating people for what they would need in life, which was in 1892 was probably agriculture for the men and home economics for the women. And uh, in those days, uh, we had about 100 majors in our program. Quinn Hall was strictly black and white. Nowadays. <laughs> Quinn Hall was still there, in, but we're in glorious color. And now we're a program in textiles, fashion, merchandising, and design. And our students learn to think in a multidisciplinary series of ways uh, in science, in business. They're artists, they're historians, and sociologists. And I'm going to try and persuade you that uh, we have a global outlook, both in terms of our faculty and our students. And now we have a whole lot more students than we used to. But we're still in Quinn Hall. Um, so, in no particular order, one of my colleagues' his basic research is in the, uh, the powwow trade of North American Indians, and that's now extending globally. She's studying the South American native textile trade with the U.S. You've probably seen stalls like this if you've been to Otavalo in Ecuador, or more recently on URI's campus outside the Memorial Union. Uh, Dean Brownell mentioned my uh, pollution prevention research. Uh, Fifteen years ago, I, I could find 40 dye houses in Rhode Island that were still working, and I worked on an EPA-funded project to help them reduce pollution. Uh, that expertise that sent me around the world to look at pollution prevention in a whole bunch of other countries. Uh, fa fascinating work with some very, very interesting people. Uh, Archaeology in locally uh, in Rhode Island, people accidentally disturb uh, native uh, North American Indian grave sites, and uh, occasionally they find textiles. Uh, when they were putting the big dig in, in Boston, they uncovered a, a 17th century privy down which an angry wife had shoved her husband's clothes, we think. Um, those were analyzed. That was local. Now we are looking globally. And one of my colleagues is spending her summers in the Honduras uh, sorting out these uh, archaeological Copan textiles. Another colleague is very, very busy uh, looking at the culture, identity, and meaning, particularly in Greek costume. She does a lot of work with the Peloponnesian Folklore Federation. She's also done work with uh, Latvian folk costume. The, uh, the, the business colleagues of mine, uh, dealing with the retailing and merchandising aspects of our program, uh, are looking at retail strategies in other countries, particularly China, Korea, India, and Japan. Uh, we learn from them, they learn from us, and that also applies when they go to visit uh, small businesses in Rhode Island who are looking for innovative retail strategies. How we treat our old people is an interesting cultural thing. We have a good gerontology program here at URI. One of my colleagues interviews people in nursing homes and figures out what they can get, what they would like to get in terms of clothing. And she correlates that now with uh, parallel studies in Korea. Another colleague looks at strictly the design aspect. What, is the, what is, was the influence of uh, foreign and global aspects of, uh, for example, Africa on jazz age fashion in the 1920s, and how that spills down into the fashion of the 21st century? My Icelandic colleague uh, looks at Icelandic folk costume. Um, it's not as authentic as you think. That's rather like a Scottish kilt. It's, it's a, a, a relatively modern invention. And we still keep these local connections. Um, 
working on patented research in medical textiles. And again, this reflects a change in Rhode Island. The traditional la large volume, low value textile industry is morphing into a, a smaller but higher value industry. And uh, we're, we're helping them out. Again, I mentioned the retail strategies for small businesses and the New England textile archaeology. We generate this knowledge. We share it. We write books. Um, just to, I found five or six books me and my colleagues have written. I, I could have found probably several more. Uh, we work in our professional organizations. Um, there's a whole bunch of alphabet soup that I didn't get to. Uh, we have lots of A's and lots of T's. The T's are usually textile. The A is usually America. Uh, but all of these will typically go on and have links around the world. I was lucky to go to India and look at the uh, Indian branch of, of my organization a couple of years ago. We have a very extensive collection of textiles, both historic and global, uh, in Quinn Hall. That supports our classroom teaching. It supports a wide range of graduate research in many global areas. I give you a list there of some of the more esoteric of those research projects. And those graduate students are now out as curators in museums around the country and around the world. But all this knowledge that we create comes back to the classroom. Um, our students are prepared for a career in what is a global industry. It's the global supply chain starts with design in this country. It ends with retailing and merchandising in this country. But in between, there's a whole lot that happens all the way around the world. And if you look at the labels in your clothes, there's the geography lesson. So we're very proud that our undergraduates enjoy those joint degrees that Alain Philippe mentioned, uh, uh, co-degrees in TMD in French and Italian, the so-called fashion languages. Uh, every semester, about 20 of our students uh, are in a foreign country, a whole range of countries. Um, there's Nancy Tong on the cover of Quad Angles, this uh, latest issue, and uh, two students in Florence with my colleague uh, Linda Welters in the fall. And we're very proud to have Lisa Marie Carroll on one of URI's billboards. Uh, she's there at another uh, study abroad experience in Italy. Uh, that's the whole semester. A lot of other students will take uh, a couple of weeks in the winter break and do a London Paris study tour. And they come back excited by their experiences. And so what I'm trying to share with you is that I, I don't think we're untypical in having an, our, our program one that's multidisciplinary. It's connected globally to a global industry. We have globally engaged faculty creating and sharing knowledge. And we hope we're preparing students to exist in that world who are globally fluent. Thank you very much. Thank you. As you can tell, we are a world-class university. When I first came here, we talked about preparing students for the Rhode Island economy. Clearly now we're preparing the well-educated global citizen through our research, through our teaching, and our outreach that does circumnavigate the globe. These are five wonderful faculty who represent all the outstanding faculty at the University of Rhode Island. I'd now like to open the floor to questions that you may have for any or all of the panelists. I have a question for Jimmy Oxley. When the, uh, the people at TF Green pull me aside for additional checks because something on my shoes has alarmed them, is that the urea that's in 30% of the samples, or is that that? Am I somehow picking up uh, explosive materials somewhere in my work here at URI? <laughs> <laughs> well, they're screening your shoes by x-ray uh, at TF Green and elsewhere. So there would be no, uh, uh, so they've taken off your shoes. They've already, if they've swabbed you, they've already been alarmed by something else. Okay? <laughs> it, it, it may be you yourself, but no, the, they, the swabbing is after they see something else. And yes, you are going. The instruments that they're using are IMS, IM mobility spectrometers. They have to function in seconds, and so there are a lot of other overlapping peaks. So it it could be a, a false alarm of many things, and it's a tough problem when you look at detection. There are a lot of of issues, 
and they have to make that decision very quickly. Maybe they made the right decision in pulling you over. <laughs> Dr. Duran, I wanted to ask, uh, this morning we heard in Providence at the symposium about uh, how English as a second language was being taught simultaneously with good nutrition to some of the community by some faculty in the nutrition department. Have you thought much about whether we can take undergraduate students and use various languages to actu actually teach the disciplines in their majors, maybe by working with faculty to upgrade their uh, abilities with trips to France, et cetera, so that we could teach health or we could teach other, other types right. of So you're asking curriculum. about teaching the, the, some of the, the dis other disciplines we offer on campus in the language. In the language, yes. yes. Well, uh, we, we already do that uh, on a, on a, a small, uh, smaller basis mainly. Like I know that some of my colleagues, for instance, uh, in the past have taught uh, or co-taught some courses in engineering, for instance, and in, uh, in German. Uh, and so, but, uh, and there is, uh, there is in, the, in the catalog uh, for French, for instance, and I believe for some other uh, of the languages, there is a, a type of credits that you can receive uh, for, uh, you know, like let's say you will take a course uh, in a different discipline that will be taught uh, three times a week and like the third hour will be taught by one of the faculty uh, in, the, in the language, in the foreign language, and then you receive an extra credit, like one of those credits uh, toward the language. Uh, it would be indeed very good, I think, if we could develop uh, that and to, to have the, uh, the sufficient uh, staff and uh, teaching hours to do it. Uh, I think it would be a very good um, uh, opportunity for our, uh, for our students. Right now also what I should say is that um, I didn't have time to, uh, to, to spend too much time on that in the 10 minutes, but some of, of uh, the other colleagues have mentioned it, is that we have seen a constant growth at URI in uh, studying abroad. More and more of our students are going abroad, and uh, many of them, uh, when they go abroad, they start taking courses uh, in different, you know, like when I was here at the, at the beginning, most of the students who would go abroad, they, they would usually take courses, intensive foreign language courses. For instance, a student who was in French, they would go to France and they would take courses uh, only in French as a foreign language. Whereas what we see more and more now is students who, read, who have reached a capacity of language uh, good enough so that by the time they get there, they can take courses along with the students from the local university in whatever disciplines interest them. And those courses transfer back here in the discipline. Um, so this is, a, this is a very good uh, opportunity for them. Or sometimes they'll, they'll combine, they'll do the first semester, the intensive language course, and then by then their, their capacity is high enough. And the second semester, they either work, many of our students have internship uh, abroad, or they will uh, take courses along with the local students. Yes. Thank you again uh, 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 for those five great talks. Um, um, it's obvious that um, um, your own uh, research projects are very, no uh, are very um, uh, noteworthy. Some of the folks in the audience might be very interested to know how you've been able to move all of the technologies that stem, fr stem from your research programs to the marketplace. And as a modern research institution, that's what we're all here to do. Uh, Martin, uh, for example, uh, most people would probably May, may not know how uh, uh, one of our full professors in, in, in um, um, an area like textiles is uh, working with a corporation that's, that actually generates uh, what we might call synthetic arteries, for example. So how, how have you managed that? Have, have, you, have you sought out your corporate partners or have the corporate partners sought you out? Those sorts of things that I think some people might be interested in knowing. Well, the, the first thing is to get the patent protection. I've enjoyed URI support in, in getting patented, getting protected. Um, I've, I've worked with outside companies in actually doing the research in the first place. So they, they've shared the patent, and that made a very a fairly complicated licensing agreement. Uh, and, and again, the, uh, the research office was very instrumental in, in sorting all those complicated details out. Um, we, we're still looking for someone to sort of say, yes, I'm going to give you $70 million to license this work. So that's, that's, the, that's the big hope. But I think we're well... We're, got a good foundation for that to happen. Seeing no other questions, I would like to 
ask you to uh, join us. The panelists have agreed to stay for a bit and talk one-on-one -on -one with you at a reception at the beautiful new building that you came through if you came from the parking lot, the Ocean Science and Exploration Center. So I understand the reception will be in the Nautilus Gallery, and there are enough wonderful people here who can guide us there. Please help me in thanking these outstanding researchers who are doing so much to improve the quality of life around the world.